Hi, Nazran here from Taylor's University, and this is my presentation about cranioplasty, prosthetic implant materials, and the manufacturing approaches behind them. Let's begin, shall we? Now, let me tell you a bit about myself. I started my mechanical engineering degree in 2018, but before that, I was a professional athlete. I was representing my country in swimming from 2015 to 2017 in multiple competitions. And throughout that career, I met a lot of Paralympic athletes. This was where I was first introduced to prosthetics and I was fascinated with the materials used to make them and the science behind and how they help the athlete. What's more, I was given special racing suits, which were made out of materials which reduce the friction in the water, which helps me swim faster. So, some of my racing suits are made out of carbon fiber, others even had hydrophobic materials in them as well. So at the end of my career, I realized that just how fascinated I was in material science and the world of prosthetics. So much so I decided engineering was what I wanted to do. And four years later, here I am now in my final year of my mechanical engineering degree. Now, my presentation will cover five main things. Number one, introduction to cranioplasty. Number two, the materials used to make this implant. Number three, the additive manufacturing processes that goes on for this implant. Number four, the post-surgery complications rate. And lastly, my final year project. Now, starting off with what exactly is cranioplasty? Cranioplasty is the secondary surgery done to restore the defect in the skull, the hole in the skull. Now, secondary means that this is done sometime after primary surgery, which is craniectomy. Craniectomy is the surgery where a part of the skull is removed to let the brain expand and swell without being compressed in. This is done due to conditions such as stroke or any deformations on the skull caused by genetic abnormalities or serious accidents. Now, remember when I mentioned this secondary surgery is done sometime after the primary one? Well, the timeline could be it varies. It can be as early as three months or as late as 12 months. It really depends on the health of the patient. But generally, they do this secondary surgery, cranioplasty, as soon as possible. And yes, as bizarre as it sounds, people do go that long with a hole in their skull. Now, let's go over the materials which are used to make this prosthetic. Now, Different materials have different properties and each of them have their own advantages and disadvantages, but generally they should exhibit most of these properties. They are number one, it should not conduct heat. Number two, it should be inert. Inert means unreactive. And the reason behind this is that it should not react to any biochemical reactions that take place inside the human body. Doing so will trigger what is called an inflammatory reaction. Now, this causes a whole host of problems from high fevers to the body rejecting the prosthetic. Now, number three, it should be malleable so that it can fit properly into the skull. That way, it results in a good cosmetic outcome, as you can see here. And number four and five relate to the mechanical properties in which it should be durable and strong enough to prevent any further trauma. Now, there are two types of materials. They are synthetic and natural. Natural materials are the actual uh, bones that are harvested from the patient's own body, and that bone is then grafted into the skull. Now, synthetic materials are man-made materials, and the most common examples are polymethylmethacrylate, PMMA for short, hydroxyapatite, and titanium. Now, as I mentioned, each material has their own advantages and disadvantages, so let's go through them. And to start off, we'll begin with PMMA. Now, PMMA is actually acrylic. Yeah, as uh, strange as it sounds, acrylic is a pretty good prosthetic material. And this material is manufactured in a process called in situ. In situ means to take place in the original place. Now, this will make sense in a while, but for now, keep in mind, in situ means in the original place. Now, this procedure is done by mixing powdered PMMA with liquid PMMA. This will initiate a polymerization reaction to form the cement. And that PMMA cement is then placed directly inside the skull. Now, 
the inside of the skull is the original place. The in situ is making a lot of sense now. It's placed directly inside the defect, and then it is left to harden to take the shape. Now, this procedure is relatively cheap and does result in a good cosmetic outcome, provided it is done properly, of course. However, remember when I mentioned this polymerization reaction? Well, this polymerization reaction is exothermic, meaning it releases a lot of heat, and that heat can cause burn damage to the local tissue area. What's more, not all the monomers react in the polymerization, and these monomers are harmful to the human body. But despite these downsides, PMMA is the most used material in cranioplasty, like I said, because it's cheap and does result in a good cosmetic outcome with little complications, right? Of course, again, if done properly. Now let's go over to hydroxyapatite. Now hydroxyapatite is a compound of calcium phosphate. Sounds familiar, right? Calcium phosphate is the same mineral found within our bones, as well as the enamel of our teeth. Now, hydroxyapatite is prepared in the same way as PMMA in the in situ approach, where hydroxyapatite powder is mixed with water to form bone cement. And that cement is placed directly inside the skull. However, there's a catch. You cannot place this bone cement alone. You have to place a titanium wire before the bone cement is placed. Now, you might be wondering, then why even bother with hydroxyapatite? PMMA does not need the titanium wire. They are both manufactured the same way. Now, you see, remember when I mentioned hydroxyapatite is a compound of calcium phosphate, the very same mineral found within our bones? As you guessed, since it is the same mineral, it bonds chemically very well with our bones, meaning it does result in good, cause, good outcomes for long term. Now, despite that, it has one major flaw, and that is its weak mechanical nature, especially it's brittle. Brittle means it's hard, yes, but it, it is more liable to break. Now, because of this, hydroxyapatite is really only suitable for smaller defects. But like I said, it does bond chemically really well with bones, making it suitable for long-term outcomes. So now let's go over the material, which is the most famous one, for almost all prosthetics, and that is titanium. And the reason why titanium is so popular is because it has excellent mechanical properties despite its low density. And it is very inert, very unreactive, meaning when we use it as a uh, prosthetic, it does not react to any biochemical reactions inside the body. If you recall when I mentioned it should not react to biochemical reactions because it will trigger what is called an inflammatory reaction and with it comes a whole host of issues. So there's a really low risk of using titanium and encountering the body, rejecting the titanium prosthetic. Now, with all these amazing features, as you guessed, it is very expensive. Titanium is an expensive material. And to make matters worse, titanium should, the titanium plates and mesh must be 3D printed precisely to fit into the defect of the skull. And with that 3D printing and the precision that comes with it adds on to the already expensive procedure. And another downside is that the titanium implant inside the skull can disrupt CT scanning machines, meaning it is difficult for the doctor to evaluate the patient's healing process after the surgery. But despite this, if the patient can afford such expensive treatments, Titanium is the way to go for almost all procedures. Like I said, it has excellent mechanical properties and it is very unreactive. It's no surprise that titanium is commonly used for all prosthetics. Now, I've been talking a bit about 3D printing, especially with the rise of Industry 4.0. It comes to no surprise that 3D printing found, found its way in medical biomedical engineering as well. Now, let me go in detail how prosthetics are, I mean, the cranioplasty prosthetics are 3D printed. Now, usually people associate 3D printing with computer-aided design software, such as SolidWorks or Autodesk. But as you pro probably imagined, designing such a geometrically complex implant using uh, SolidWorks or computer uh, Autodesk is extremely difficult. It does run the risk of the implant not fitting properly into the skull as well. 
but there is a way to overcome this. Now, first step is we medic, we scan the skull using MRIs and CT scans, and then we use machine algorithms to take the information from these scans and then construct 3D models. Now, these 3D models are constructed by segmenting them, again, as I mentioned, using the information from the CT or MRI scans. And then finally, we can convert this 3D model into an STL file. STL file stands for Standard Triangulation Language. This will sound similar to those involved in 3D printing because this file is the most versatile file format out there. It is accepted by almost any type of 3D printing machine, no matter how complex or simple it is. A complex machine could be a jet binding machine or a metal extrusion machine. A simple machine could be a thermoplastic extrusion 3D printer. No matter how complex or simple, as I said, almost all machines accept the STL file format. Now, the reason why 3D printing the uh, template and the implant is so important is because number one, it gives something physical for the surgeon and the patient to hold. When they can hold something physically, they can better understand the anatomy of the cranium. What's more, uh, we can double check whether the implant can properly fit into the skull. That way we can avoid any unforeseen problems during the actual surgery. It's amazing to see how far we've come with 3D printing. And with it, there are some experimental methods as well, which brings me to my next one. Now, I found this experimental method pretty interesting because it involves a bit of 3D printing and die casting. But this time they 3D print the skull with a defect and the implant with a cheap material, usually a thermoplastic like polylactic acid. And using this implant, they make the die cast molds the die cast molds are usually made out of silicon so that it can take the imprint easily. And once the molds are ready, the molds are then filled with the PMMS cement and then compressed together. They are compressed together and left to harden. That and they are left for a while until the implant is ready. And now we have here the final finish. After sterilization, of course, it is then used in surgery. Yeah. Now, the purpose of the die cast and the 3D printing combination is to provide a cheaper alternative to those who cannot afford the expensive procedures. What's more, it is only suitable for smaller defects. The thing with die casting is it is nowhere near as precise as 3D printing. So it is only suitable for defects that are small and not that geometrically complex. But like I said, it does pose promise for those who cannot afford expensive procedures. Now, despite all these amazing materials and manufacturing methods, there's one huge problem, and that is the complication rate. The complications rate go up to a staggering 41%. To give reference, most neurological procedures go up to 5% at most. So on the surface, yeah, I mean, excuse me, on the surface, this procedure seems simple, right? We are simply just filling a hole in the skull. So how come the complication rates are so high? They range from cerebrospinal fluid accumulating in the skull to seizures, but out of all of them, uh, the one with the highest amount is bacterial infections, which begs the question, is there a way to overcome such high infection rates? And that is where my final year project comes in. The topic of my final year project is additively manufactured patient-specific cranioplasty implants with antibacterial properties. The aim of my study is to 3D print an implant from PMMA and then chemically modify it with antibacterial properties. Now, this will achieve two things. Number one, if the PMMA implant can be 3D printed, it can overcome the problems from in situ. Remember how I mentioned earlier that in the PMMA in situ approach is a polymerization reaction which releases heat and unreacted monomers, which causes burn damage to the tissue area and the monomers are harmful to the human body. But if it can be 3D printed, it can overcome that problem. And number two, if I can successfully modify it with antibacterial agents, it could reduce the bacterial infections post-surgery. 
Now, my final year project is split into two, FYP1, which is the research phase, and FYP2, which is the experimental phase. Now, I recently finished my FYP1, and it went swimmingly well. I won first place in my university for the mechanical engineering of FYP1. And my FYP2, which is, as I mentioned, the experimental phase will begin soon in August, in the end of August. And I am extremely excited to see what results I can obtain through my experiments. As I said, I'm very passionate about prosthetics. And in the end, I, can, I hope I can successfully make a prosthetic or at the very least pave the way for more research in the world of prosthetics. Again, I'm extremely grateful for this opportunity to share my passion. And with it, that concludes my presentation. I look forward to our Q&A session. Thank you all once again.